Here we are again, the three of us, and you guys obviously. Um, I'm going to give you what you asked for, you asked for the stomach, so we're going to talk about the anatomy of the stomach. I've had a cup of tea, you could probably do with uh, some sugar, but that should be good. Um, I think the reason I've kind of put off talking about the stomach is because, well, it's really simple isn't it? It's just like a tube muscle and uh, what is there to talk about? We did the stomach back in school. Um, and then as I started um, looking at the anatomy, I remembered that there is actually quite a lot to talk about. Um, we'll do a little bit of embryology just to introduce where the stomach comes from. We'll talk about then the parts of the stomach, so the names of the parts. We'll talk about the, uh, the layers of the stomach, so the histological structure of the stomach, why we see these folds on the inside. I will talk a little bit about the, the functions of the stomach, but not a great deal because I'm doing anatomy. I'm not doing physiology, that's somebody else's job. I don't get paid to teach physiology. Um, we'll talk about the blood supply, we'll talk about the venous drainage, GI tract, where does the venous drainage go to? Um, and we'll talk about the innovation. Look at all these nerves we can see over the surface of this model. Um, another interesting thing to talk about might be, um, can you survive without your stomach? And of course, um, a pretty famous surgery these days is, is, is stomach stapling or um, gastric bypass surgery in which the stomach is made smaller in cases of um, where people need, they've got very, very heavy, they've got a huge amount of fat on them and need some extreme weight loss. Otherwise they're at risk of other um, morbidities. Does stomach stapling help? Does uh, gastric bypass surgery actually help with weight loss? Okay, so this is the stomach. It has been removed up here. We can see the esophagus taking food into the stomach and down here we can see the start of the small intestine. So the first part of the small intestine is the duodenum. So what, what are the functions of the stomach then? Well, um, it's kind of, it's like a, a storage is its main one, right? It's a bag um, and it stretches really nicely. So it's quite small when there's no food in there and it stretches to what? Four liters if you fill it with fluid and food and that sort of thing. It's a very stretchy organ. And the reason we need this storage bag <coughs> is because of course, um, I mean nowadays we can just go to the supermarket and get food and eat however we want, but we tend to eat big. But back in the day, you know, when you were like hunting and uh, farming and foraging and that sort of thing, you'd get food and think, I'm going off track here, aren't I? If you think about other animals and as well as, you know, basically if you have a meal, if you have some food, you need to eat that food, you want to store it in the stomach. So when we chew the food, that's the start of mechanical digestion. When we put it in the stomach, that's then the start of uh, chemical digestion. And the stomach is a storage site for this food that we eat because we actually digest the food and absorb the nutrients quite slowly. Um, if you put a meal into your stomach, it might take two, three, four hours for that whole meal to get pushed out of the stomach and into the duodenum. And the, the food, gets mixed with, um, you know, uh, enzymes and hydrochloric acid, all the bits that the stomach are making, which we'll come to later. And as the food is broken up and churned up in a particular bag, so it still does some of that mechanical digestion of moving things around and mixing up the food with all the, the that, those initial uh, chemical digestive agents, um, that forms chyme. And that chyme is squirted into the duodenum at about three mil a go, three milliliters a squirt, that's about all. And, and that passes into the duodenum. And as we saw in this, when we were looking at the small intestine, most of the absorption of the digestion occurs in the small intestine. So as that, as that food gets absorbed and moves along, um, the duodenum and this region of the stomach work together to say, well, let's have a bit more, pass it, and so on and so on and so on. So the rate of digestion is slow within the small intestine. So we need to store the food in the stomach partly to start breaking it down, but also so we can just pass it into the small intestine, the organ that's really doing the work of digestion and absorption bit by bit. Uh, and of course, I mean, the rest of digestion can take 24 hours or, 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 or far longer um, for the com whatever you eat to be completely digested. So that's one function. Also, as I said, it makes a bunch of things which helps with digestion. But something else that's important is that, um, we'll look at the cells in a bit. Um, some of the cells make something called intrinsic factor. An intrinsic factor is crucial to vitamin B12 absorption 
later on in the small intestine. You need vitamin B12 so that you can make new erythrocytes, new red blood cells, but you also need vitamin B12 for normal neurological function. If you have a deficiency in vitamin B12, then we'll see anemia and we might see changes in neurological function. Not good changes either. So the stomach does that too. What about the parts of the stomach then? Okay, then let's do a little dissection. Take the liver out, it's the liver's. So the liver is partly anterior to the stomach if we take the liver out. So you see how the liver and the stomach overlap, right? Now here's the stomach. So this is where the esophagus enters the stomach. And notice how this is close to the heart. So this gets called the cardia. This region of the stomach here kind of gets called the cardia. This bit up here, this is the fundus. So that's kind of like the sacky bit, usually furthest away from somewhere. Anyway, so this is the fundus up here, sticking up here. Um, and then this, the rest of the, the stomach here is the body. Um, and as we get down here, right, so this, this is then the pylorus. Um, so it gets towards like a, it gets like a funnel shape, right? So this is the pyloris, and the pyloric antrum is kind of the funnely bit. And then down here we've got the pyloric canal, which is the tube bit, and that's surrounded by um, a thick muscular sphincter, which is the pyloric sphincter. the start of the duodenum there. There's that funnel I was talking about. So this is the pyloric antrum and then here we're getting to the pyloric canal here and you see the sphincter here and the sphincter, the pyloric sphincter is really controlling the flow of chyme into the duodenum. So this is really important. Um, and the other notable feature is the shape of the stomach. It's, it's a very distinctive shape, isn't it? Now this curve here, this is the greater curvature, and this curve here is the lesser curvature. Now in the embryo, so we start off with this nice big cavity within the embryo and a gut tube running through the cavity, and it's held to the posterior abdominal wall by the dorsal mesentery, right, so it's hanging in the space. Um, and it starts off as a, simple, as a simple tube, and at the level of the stomach, that tube, that tube just dilates. Right, so the esophagus doesn't dilate, remains a thin tube. The stomach region does dilate and becomes a, a fat tube, and that's the stomach. But one side grows faster than the other, giving the greater curvature. So it gives it this shape just by one side growing faster than the other. And the other thing that occurs is that um, that tube then rotates, right? So, um, so it would have been like this, the tube, and then it rotates in the abdomen, pushing the duodenum out to the right side and giving it the C shape. Now the reason that's relevant is because, look, this nerve here, this is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is going to give parasympathetic innervation to the stomach and the rest of the GI tract. And look, you see one nerve here, and we see one nerve here. Now actually, this nerve, this is the left vagus nerve, and this nerve is the right vagus nerve, and they've travelled down into the abdomen with the esophagus, and they've gone through the diaphragm with the esophagus. And now, because in the adult the stomach sits like this, that left vagus nerve is now anterior, because the stomach rotated, and the right vagus nerve is posterior, because the stomach rotated. Cool, huh? We can see the embryology in the adult anatomy. That's why embryology is useful. It explains what we see in the adult. Um, the other thing on this model, of course, is that, look, as we open this model up, it's filled with folds. We call these folds rougie. They've got some boring modern name, gastric folds, I think. Gas yeah, ga most things, yeah, if it's stomach, it's gastric, right? The gastric folds. And these rougie, these are folds. These basically show you, they're not, they're not there for surface area, like the villi in the small intestine. They show you how much this bag can stretch, can expand, because this is a stomach that's kind of relaxed. And the folds are present as the stomach expands, those rougi will get flattened out, right? Um, so these regions of the stomach, the cells here are all slightly different as well. But um, the stomach usually has some air in it. 
because because well we've got the esophagus going to uh, this hole here right so there's always air in there so if you look at an x-ray you're looking at an mr scan you're looking at a ct scan you're likely to see air up here in the fundus if the patient is sat up if they're led down then the air is going to go into the body right so that makes the stomach quite easy to find when you're looking at radiology radiography because um, you know on most of those there'll be the air will be black you'll find a dark patch that'll show you where the stomach is the other trick of course is to remember the stomach is you know look this is the spleen this is the pancreas so the stomach is anterior to those things there's the adrenal gland there and what have you so it's anterior to those and then of course it's overlapped so it's it's posterior to the to the liver and the greater curvature so and being part of the GI tract and it was originally a simple tube held in place by mesentery means it's still held in place by mesentery the the stomach is is reasonably well fixed in place and it can, it can expand and shrink and what have you and move around a little bit in that respect but it's largely fixed in place but that mesentery is still there now the the greater curvature was posterior in the embryo and from the greater curvature we see the greater momentum this this fold of of mesentery going back from the greater curvature covering over the um, the small intestine and the large intestine and then eventually going back to the posterior abdominal wall so the greater curvature has the greater momentum the lesser curvature has the lesser momentum attached to it and the lesser momentum runs between the lesser curvature of the stomach and goes out to the the liver and covers the liver right so in a patient or in a body if you lift up the liver you'll see a sheet of mesentery the less momentum between the stomach and the liver and that's how the liver is connected to all this stuff so that's easy to remember isn't it now if we look at the structure of the stomach and we look at the layers here we find that the structure so the ultra structure the histological structure the organization of the cells the layers of the tissues is very similar to the rest of the gi tract which is, should be no surprise because it's it's formed from the same tube as the rest of the GI tract and then we have a, a mucosa lining the internal surface of the stomach but it's a little bit specialized here and then we have um, connective tissue holding that in place and then we have layers of smooth muscle and then we have um, serosa over the top right but the the mucosa of the stomach is a little bit special because as you know the stomach is an acidic environment now what we see is we see um, if you look at the surface here it's it's quite flat the mucosa is quite flat um, made up of those epithelial cells derived from endoderm uh, but we see we see pits right so we see these these pits diving down from that epithelial surface and those are the gastric pits now we're in the small intestine we also see villi going up we don't have any villi in the stomach because this isn't really a site of absorption I think like you can absorb minor amounts of things like maybe alcohol stuff like that in the stomach but the stomach isn't a site of absorption it's a site of mechanical and chemical digestion this is where digestion starts now the cells up here are mostly producing mucus so not particularly interesting but the cells down here down in those gastric pits those gastric pits lead to gastric glands and in those gastric glands a number of different cells secrete a number of different things which produces gastric juice and that gastric juice then mixes with the food to form chyme very sensible naming system so far right now, as we look inside those um, gastric glands we see parietal cells and those are the cells that are making the hydrochloric acid so the pH of the stomach is usually between about one and a half and three and a half and that acid is useful um, and it's those those parietal cells are also making that intrinsic factor that I talked about now the acid we have chief cells also in the gastric glands which are making pepsinogen and what we're trying to do here is something quite dangerous we're trying to denature and digest proteins and we are made up of proteins the chief cells make um, an inactive form of pepsin they make pepsinogen and the hydrochloric acid activates the pepsinogen and turns it into pepsin a protease which can then start denaturing proteins now the the acidic environment will also denature the proteins 
So that starts off the process of digestion of proteins. Uh, it'll also kill some of the bacteria that go into the stomach, which is helpful. Um, but that acid is also dangerous to the epithelial cells lining the stomach. We also have some other mucus cells within the gastric glands making um, an acidic mucus. But we also have like your normal goblet cells, normal-ish, making um, a mucus with bicarbonate in it. So then there's a mucus lining the very surface of the epithelium, which has bicarbonate, which neutralizes the hydrochloric acid to protect the epithelium. But the, the food and the chyme has a much higher or much lower pH, much higher, much, much more acidic, right? Um, and the epithelial cells, they're also stuck together by tight junctions to try to prevent that hydrochloric acid from getting between the cells. Also within the stomach, the stem cells there are really, really busy, so they're constantly replacing the epithelial cells as they get damaged. So the stomach is kind of, it's protected from the acid, and that process of activating the inactive peptinogen is also protecting the stomach, right? So this is quite a hostile environment because it's digesting. Um, you know, things like, if you think about digesting meat, well, we are meat, you don't really want to be digesting yourself from the stomach. Now, if, um, if that protective mucus is lost, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories can remove the protective mucus lining of the stomach if you take a lot of NSAIDs. Um, and Helicobacter pylori is quite a famous organism now for also living in the stomach and, and, and clearing away the mucus, protecting the epithelia. Now if that occurs, then the acid can quite quickly erode the epithelium and that's when we see a gastric ulcer, a stomach ulcer, and the epithelium gets eroded away and it's very painful. And of course, if that erosion continues to occur, it can pass through the muscle and it can rupture these blood vessels in the outside of the stomach, which we'll look at in a moment. So in the gast gastric glands, we've got the parietal cells, the chief cells, the mucus cells, and then we've also got a bunch of enteroendocrine cells. And we saw enteroendocrine cells in the small intestine as well. So while the activity of the GI tract is regulated by the nervous system. It's also locally regulated by hormones. Now, down here in the pylorus, also in the small intestine and the pancreas, um, a hormone is made called gastrin and gastrin increases the activity of the cells making hydrochloric acid in the stomach. We also have enteroendocrine cells that produce ghrelin. Ghrelin is the hormone that uh, makes you feel full satiety, you feel satiated, I've eaten enough. That's ghrelin. Um, you have cells making serotonin, which is usually associated with the brain, right? And serotonin causes the smooth muscle of the stomach to contract. And then you also see histamine being made, which also increases the activity of the, hydrochlor the um, hydrochloric acid producing cells. And then you also have cells making somatostatin. Somatostatin does the opposite and it causes everything to slow down. So it slows down the activity of the stomach and the small intestine and says, that's it, digestion is over. All right, so that's, um, those are the names of the parts of the stomach. That's the histological structure of the stomach and some of the stuff that's going on there without going into a lot of physiology. Let's get back to anatomy then. Let's look at the blood supply to the stomach. Now, the stomach is part of the foregut, which means that it will be supplied with blood by branches of the celiac trunk, right? So from the anterior, sorry, from the abdominal aorta, we've got three anterior branches. Uh, from the abdominal aorta, we have the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric artery, and the inferior mesenteric artery. And the celiac trunk will supply blood to structures derived from the foregut. The superior mesenteric artery will supply blood to structures derived from the midgut, and the inferior mesenteric artery will supply blood to structures derived from the hindgut. Stomach is foregut, so celiac trunk. Um, now, what do we see? Well, now if we look at the stomach, we can see a number of arteries. Now, if we look inside the, the lesser curvature here, all right, in the lesser curvature, we have the left and right gastric arteries. That's easy. Now. The thing that people often don't appreciate is that you've got like your left and your, your right gastric arteries coming in here. So 
So, so it looks like you've got like two arteries. To, which way is the blood flowing? The two arteries are going. Well, of course, what's happening is is that the the blood is flowing into the arteries and it's flowing out of the arteries into the capillary beds of the stomach and the arterioles and that sort of thing. So we have the left gastric artery coming in and the right gastric artery coming in. Now the left gastric artery, you can just see here where it's coming from. The left gastric artery is a direct branch of the celiac trunk, but the right gastric artery has to come from a little further away. The trick here is that the right gastric artery is actually coming from the hepatic artery. If the hepatic artery, there's the celiac, if the hepatic artery is coming from the celiac trunk over here to get to the, the liver, then there's a branch here which is coming off the hepatic artery, which is non-existent in this model. Um, there's a cut end there, there's a cut end there. Yeah. The right gastric artery is coming from that and then coming around the lesser curvature of the stomach there. If we take the stomach out, we can see we've also got a lovely artery running around the greater curvature of the stomach. This is an artery, this is actually two arteries with some lovely names. Um, we have the right and left gastro-omental arteries, or my favorite, the left and right gastro-epiploic arteries. Essentially both mean the same thing, They're referring to the omentum here, right? Uh, ep oh yeah. Gastroepiploic, though, it's a lovely word, isn't it? So the left and right gastroepiploic arteries. Now, where does the left gastroepiploic artery come from? Um, now, do you see here? So here's the celiac trunk, here's the, the pancreas, here's the spleen. This artery running out here, that's the splenic artery. It's supplying blood to the spleen, but the stomach overlies that, it also is going to give off a branch from this end of the splenic artery and that is going to form the, uh, the left gastroepiploic artery. So the left gastroepiploic artery is going to come around here and then on this side from the hepatic artery again we have the, the gastroduodenal artery. So like there's the pylorus of the stomach, there's the duodenum. Now, in between, like underneath there, in that gap, in there, that's where we're going to find the gastroduodenal artery. Gastroduodenal is going to supply blood to the stomach and the duodenum. And as it comes out here, it then forms, it gives off the, uh, the right gastroepiploic or right gastroomental artery, which comes around here. That's most of the story, but not the whole story. Um, there are posterior gastric arteries, so the stomach is overlying this splenic artery here, right? So from the splenic artery, we get a little artery here, which is the posterior gastric artery, because it's posterior to the stomach, right? And then also, from this end here, we get some short gastric arteries coming from the splenic artery to supply blood to uh, the fundus and the body of the stomach out there. So that's the arterial supply. Venous drainage, well, the veins have the same names as the arteries, but as this is part of the GI tract, where is the venous blood going to? It's going to the liver. All of the blood from the GI tract goes to the liver. So we've got these veins, which are, so again, you've got the splenic vein back there, so the venous corollaries, the venous versions of the arteries are going back along the same routes. Look, we haven't got them on here, we just see the arteries, but there are veins there as well. There are gastroepiploic veins and left and right gastric veins and that sort of thing. Um, they're going to drain back to the splenic vein, which of course is going to drain into the portal vein. Um, some of these around here are going to drain. So this side here, this is going to drain down into the superior mesenteric vein, which is also going to drain into the portal vein and so on. So essentially the, the, the veins of the stomach match the arteries of the stomach, but they drain back to the splenic vein, superior mesenteric vein, portal vein to get back to the liver, just like the rest of the GI tract. Now for lymphatic drainage, the lymph, the lymph from the stomach, there are collections of nodes, gastric nodes, around the greater curvature and the lesser curvature and what have you. So like the superior two-thirds of the stomach, the lymph will first of all drain to gastric nodes nearby. 
Um, but otherwise, the lymphatic drainage is going to follow the venous roots. So we've got pyloric lymph nodes around here and pancreaticoduodenal lymph nodes around there. Have a look at the blood, have a look at the venous drainage. Get that map in your head. Remember that there are gastric nodes and pyloric nodes, but remember, just imagine the flow going in a similar sort of direction. But the flow isn't probably really going to the liver, it's mostly going to those paraaortic lymph nodes around the celiac trunk. So the lymph nodes around here and then back up to the thoracic duct and so on. Innovation to the stomach, we've already mentioned that. Vagus nerve carries parasympathetic innovation from the brain into the abdomen, so that's innovating, you know, the GI tract. And we see the left and right vagus nerves here becoming anterior and posterior on the stomach. Um, and of course the parasympathetic division of the nervous system is famous for its rest and digest functions. So this is really switching on a lot of you know, the digestive actions, the activity of the GI tract. Uh, the sympathetic nerves, as usual, they're following the arteries into their target organs and around the celiac trunk we see uh, the celiac ganglion and we see the celiac plexus uh, and the greater splanchnic nerve is carrying sympathetic nerves in there and what have you. So essentially, sympathetic innervation comes from postganglionic sympathetic nerves of the, sympath of the uh, celiac plexus and then follow the arteries in to get to the stomach. So there you go, those are the parts of the stomach, the location of the stomach, stuff nearby the stomach. Um, nervous innervation, arterial supply, venous drainage, the layers, the cells, the functions and that sort of thing. So, can you survive without a stomach? Yes and no. Yes, you can remove your stomach and uh, hook up the small intestine to whatever is left, but you'd only be able to eat, you know, small meals regularly. But of course, the big thing here is the loss of intrinsic factor. If you lose the stomach, you won't have any cells making intrinsic factor. You won't be able to absorb vitamin B12, which is going to be crucial for normal neural function and producing new erythrocytes, um, new red blood cells. So you would need injections of vitamin B12 because you the point eating it because you can't digest it, right? So you can, but you need the thing. And the other thought was, um, what about a gastric bypass surgery? Now, what gastric bypass surgery does, or you know, colloquial call, colloquially called stomach stapling, it's a lot of alliteration. Um, what happens there is the stomach gets divided into two, so it becomes a very small pouch, I think like a tenth of its original size. Now, both of those two pouches after the stomach has been divided and, you know, like imagine making two pouches where right? you're sticking the sides together. Both of those two pouches are connected to the small intestine, but the esophagus only goes into the small pouch. So that means that you can only eat small meals. Um, the stomach stretches um, just with small meals, so you feel full, which means you eat less food. There are a wide range of risks associated with this surgery. Um, which means that it should be reserved for um, those that are what you might, you know, might be termed morbidly obese or obese to a point where there are already a number of risks and comorbidities. Then bariatric bypass surgery, gastric bypass surgery might be helpful. But it is risky. It's not an easy, an easy thing. So the stomach is actually quite an important organ. There's actually quite a lot going on here. All right.